morning. My name is Atara Smith, and I have the pleasure of being your virtual worship host today. While we continue to worship remotely, even if you are not a regular attender at Whole Life Church, we are happy to serve as your local church until your local church begins to gather together again. We also want to encourage you to invite some friends and family over to worship with you safely in your home. This is a shared experience. We have a few announcements. Next week, we begin a new series titled Worshiping in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We'll be exploring how this 1960s children's program has the potential to inform the church's responsibility towards kindness and inclusion. Pastor Andy will begin the series talking about what do you do with the mad that you feel? In preparation for Pastor Andy's message, we'd like to encourage you to take time this week to watch the film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which can be found on Redbox. Another great resource for this series is the podcast, Finding Fred. We have members and attenders who are currently struggling with COVID. Though unrelated to COVID, unfortunately, we have also had a few deaths. We want to keep these families in our prayers. Those who died were longtime members, Mary Alice Custonia, Judd Wilcox, Edgar Cruz's father, and Mike Jacobs' mother. Join us now in prayer. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to worship freely. I thank you for your blessings, both seen and unseen. I ask in this extremely uncertain times that you help us remember that you are a constant God and will always love us. Help our faith to grow stronger in times when the enemy is attacking us. Show off, Lord. Continue to bless our families with a roof over our heads, food on the table, and safety. Be with the families that have lost loved ones and remind them that there will soon be no more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again. Continue to prepare us for our eternal home. Amen. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Spinella. About 12 years ago, my sister-in-law came to me and said, I feel like God is telling me to start an orphanage. She and I were kind of perplexed, but we started praying about it. We would meet weekly and we would pray for where, how, when God, and just lay it all out to him. And then God opened doors to Tanzania. And we went there and we fell in love with the people and the culture and the country as a whole. It's just beautiful. We move forward in faith, knowing that God would have to provide everything for this to come together and to really, really happen. And today we have 25 girls in our home. We have 300 students at our school and we employ about 45 people in Tanzania. It's an amazing thing God has done. Understandably, during this time of uncertainty, giving is down. And we need your help to make sure that our girls are provided for, that all of our employees can get paid. And there, if you have the means, and if you feel inclined, the website where you can donate will be up on the screen right now. I love our community in Tanzania, and I also really love my community here at Whole Life Church. This church has a passion to love and serve the people around us in our community. And many of those things, many of those ministries that happen within this church and in our community are supported through church budget. So right now, I wanna invite you to click on the link below or go to our church website and join in worship through giving. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Spinella and I'm a member of Whole Life Church. I'm also a founding board member at Small Steps for Compassion. Small Steps for Compassion is a girls' home and school in Tanzania, Africa. I get asked a lot by church members, is there anything I can do to help Small Steps when I'm here in America? And I have a small thing that I'm gonna tell you about today that can make a big impact. 
I know now more than ever, many of us are staying at home and quarantining, and you're probably doing a lot of your shopping online, maybe even on Amazon. If you go to smile.amazon.com, you can select Small Steps for Compassion as your charity. Then every time you make a purchase on smile.amazon, Amazon will give a percentage of that sale to Small Steps for Compassion. It's a little thing that can help our girls and our school in a big way. We hope you'll take a few minutes to set that up on your computer and start making your purchases there. Thank you so much for your support of Small Steps for Compassion. It takes a village to raise a child is an African proverb that remains true even as we leave childhood. We were created for relationship, and this is why communities of faith are so important. In this letter to the Romans, Paul reminds the people of their responsibility to each other. It is within the body of believers where hope is found and grace is realized. Romans 15, 4, 6. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stories of the Bible, the parable of the lost son. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. Jesus taught everyone about God's love. All kinds of people would come to hear Jesus speak, including tax collectors and people who made bad choices. This made the Pharisees and Jewish leaders mad. Ah, yuck. They didn't think that Jesus should be around these kind of people. So Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, um, excuse me? I want my share of your estate now, before you die. Okay. So his father agreed and gave his son his inheritance. A woohoo! A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings. See ya! And moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Huh? About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Aw, oh, man. And he began to starve. Hey, you! He convinced a local farmer to hire him. Thank you. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the food he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Finally, he said to himself, at home even the servants have food enough to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I know. I will go home to my father and apologize and ask him to take me on as a servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Sir! His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost 
but now he is found. So the party began. All right, yeah! Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. Huh? Hey, you! And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Woohoo! All right! Party time! All right! Yahoo! The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. Oh, oh man! But he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after wasting your money, you celebrate by giving him a great feast. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Where do you turn in times of crisis? When life goes haywire, when bad things come our way, when we're confused and frustrated, what's the first line, the primary line of defense? It's interesting me to, for me to think about what Jesus turned to in moments when there was a, a big need, a, a pressing need, a crisis of some kind. Those times when the task seemed too large for him or or in moments when pain and grief came upon him, what was hard decisions that had he made? What, where did he turn? It, it's interesting. Uh, my, my first casual answer, of course, is that Jesus, when he had a, a big need or of a crisis or was in life had gone a little crazy, would go out into the desert or the wilderness to find a quiet place to gain strength from communion with his Father. Maybe, maybe my mind goes there most easily because then I can decide to sort of be like Jesus. And in moments of crisis, I can simply uh, go off by myself and think and pray. Well, it's true that Jesus gained strength to face the challenges of his ministry in this world. His story reveals to us in the Gospels another source of strength, another source that was regularly used by him that gained him lots of strength, and that is simply the companionship of others. We don't have good records from Bethlehem until Jesus is left at the temple, uh, there when his parents leave and he's talking to the religious leaders. There's a big gap. And then we have another gap from when the, he goes home with them from that experience until he begins his ministry. I, I wish we had stories. I wish we had stories where we found out how his grandparents spoken to his life? How did aunts and uncles uh, that were around them in the village of Nazareth, how did they impact his upbringing? Cousins and friends and, uh, and companions. Who taught him in the synagogue? Where did he turn for adult advice as, as he tried to move toward maturity? Well, what we do know from our, the story that is recorded is that when he began his public ministry, it was not something he did all alone. First he finds Andrew, who then brings his brother Peter. Jesus calls James and John his cousins. And, and then there's Philip and Thomas and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon and Judas and Bartholomew. When, when the bad news came to Jesus and his group about John the Baptist's death, Jesus didn't go off alone to sorrow and to process no, he called these 12 together and they went off to a solitary place to rest, to grieve, and to heal together in community. Uh, when Jesus is going to meet his, with his father on the mountain we call the Mount of Transfiguration, he doesn't do it alone. He, he calls Peter, James, and John to go up the mountain with him, that that might be a shared experience. Hassled by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, plagued by teachers of religious law, looking to trick Jesus in some way with a certain question. Uh, 
seeking to trip him up, he would not take refuge by going off necessarily by himself. He often took refuge by going to a place like the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, where he could just relax and be himself. And on the night before the crucifixion, he gathers these 12 men together, and they share that supper we call the Last Supper. It's in fellowship. It's in community they do this. He, he leads them. He meets with them. He wants to find strength even in their weak, in their weak presence with him. He and the leaven leave that upper room and go to the garden, and there's a place of prayer where they pray, and then he takes Peter and James and John again and goes further into the garden in fellowship with them, in unity with them, and then he goes by himself and prays to his Father as well. He finds strength in the companionship. God has created us as social beings, just as he himself is a eternally social God. He, he's always lived in this group life we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Listen carefully to the interview we'll be doing today with Hurley Paulini. Read. Uh, listen for counsel to recognize that God is with us. And, but also, listen for the call for us to be there for one another, God's hands and feet in our world. We all, we all need somebody. As Bill Withers wrote so well in the song, sometimes in our lives we all have pain. We all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. For it won't be long till I'm going to need someone to lean on. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need somebody to lean on. I hope that today's interview will encourage you to lean on and be leaned on as we serve one another in love.
Hey, Whole Life Church, we are just so excited to be worshiping here with you today, and we just want to let you know that God loves you, and no matter what happens in your life, no matter what circumstances or what obstacles the enemy puts in your way, God is going to change this around. He can turn your grave into a garden. He can turn your sea into a highway, so please give God the glory. Let's just praise him today.
Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. 
Hi, and welcome to Whole Life Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're so glad that you were able to join us today for our worship service. This summer, we're interviewing four of our members or member families and uh, helping to get their perspective on what we've been going through in the crisis and to hopefully learn from each other. Uh, the scriptures tell us to encourage one another, and our goal is that these conversations will be encouraging to you. I know you're going to enjoy today's interview. Before we begin, let's just uh, stop for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your grace in our lives, for the fact that you're there for us in all the different circumstances. We pray for courage and strength, comfort and sustaining for uh, all the people who have been touched by the COVID crisis and also just um, our world in general. We pray that you will come and have your way and your will in all of our lives and in your world. And bless us now as we have conversation, uh, that this might be uh, the words we say, the thoughts that we share might be encouraging for each one who's listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So today we have Dr. Hurley Paulini Reed. Is that the whole thing? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, she has a wonderful counseling practice as a counseling psychologist. And mm -hmm. we're just glad. I, we'll get, we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later on as well, to get some of that expertise. Uh, so, you're also the mother of three grown sons. Yes. Uh, you and Steve are members here, um, yes. very engaged. And but the three boys, I'm just curious. I have to ask, where are where are they? How they doing? Right. So, two of them, the youngest and the middle one, are in Seattle. Uh, 
So high tech, and that surprised me. Right, <laughs> high tech, and um, also really the the hotbed right now of a whole lot of unrest. You mm. know, so they've been in quarantine for oh, a long right. time, five months or so. They've been working from home. Uh, the youngest is kind of part of the political process there, and works for for um, a civic ventures kind of an organization, mm -hmm. and he is communication director. So he's a busy guy these days with yeah. so much oh, going so on. so much in Seattle, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the oldest and his wife, they were in California just until recently. They ha actually have taken the year, this was before the pandemic, they started last year uh, traveling in their big RV. They can work from anywhere, and so they've been hitting all the major spots uh, in the U.S., but they had been in California for the past several months because of the lockdown. Sure. They just this week moved to Oregon, and from there they are headed to see the, the brothers in Washington. Well, great. Well, that'll, yeah. that'll be, they'll all three be together for a little bit. Yes. Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So um, you were just telling me before we started, yes. uh, I was going to ask if you and your family are healthy, but you've yes. had the COVID crisis come very close to home. Yes. Uh, tell us, tell us what's happened. So um, an incredible loss, actually, mm. Pastor Andy. Um, just this past Saturday night, early morning, uh, on Sunday, Father's Day, oh. right? We got the news that my, my wonderful cousin, who is a doctor, a general surgeon in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, um, who was fighting, you know, the virus that he got 10 days ago, he, he lost the battle. Mm. And I tell you, our family was in deep grief. It was sure. uh, a Father's Day where he left four kids behind, a oh. wife, and, and just a wonderful human being in the world. He was just one of those really gentle and, and really caring mm -hmm. souls. So we are right now, I mean, if we were not grieving before, which we were, a hundred oh, sure. and some thousand people in our country have right. died, and, and we, have, we suffer together, right? But now it's so personal. Mm -hmm. You know, it has come so close to us. And and he yeah. contracted this as he was trying to help. I yeah, understand. so he didn't have to be in the front lines at this time because he was really pretty well set mm -hmm. and he had been home and he saw his colleagues <laughs> suffering and really overwhelmed and he volunteered wow. actually to go help them. And through that process for the several months that he did that, he contracted the virus and, and, and really it was looking like he was going to beat it until this virus just takes you down and attacks all kinds of parts of your body. So some people fare really well, others don't. And he was a healthy guy, not old, and it still really took him down in a yeah. very fast way. Oh, so yeah. you, you have to like pause and have such respect for what's happening here and how it's impacting all of our lives. I think that's a, it's a, it's a great message about, uh, the unknowns right. and us making right. sure we're caring for others yes. in that process as that's, well. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Early, as a clinical psychologist, what are some yes. of your early thoughts mm. as this pandemic was just beginning uh, mm. in, the, in the mental health care of right. people? Um, right. Wow. That's a huge question. We could <laughs> talk for hours about that. But, uh, you know, some of the things that have come to me kind of more often, the first one is, this is like on many levels an affront to our mental health as well. Mm -hmm. Because look at how people are dying in isolation without their loved ones. Yeah. Look at how we can't be with each other. This was really evident to me now in our loss where we couldn't be together as a family. And giving hugs and no. consoling. and exactly. The things that usually comfort us. So we are, we are challenged in, in, in our emotional mm -hmm. health right now. Um, I would say the other piece that really challenges us is this piece where they've called it social distancing, which is an unfortunate yeah, way of putting it. Physical distancing would be a much better word. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, because there's nothing that would be actually more true than to say we have to step up the social closeness mm -hmm. right now in order to cope. Yeah. What makes us more resilient is connection, right. actually. Mm. So that's the second piece. And I would say the third one is how fast things are changing and how you have to adapt from moment to moment. So you don't have control <sighs> yeah. over anything pretty no, much. That's right. Right? And so you have to flex and flex and continue to do so, you know, adapting every step of the way. And that's a real challenge as well. 
So you've noticed a change in your clients as well? Absolutely. So my clients are mostly doctors. I work with doctors from all over mm. the country and, and from here as well. And so there, there's, there are different variables there. Some are in the front lines and mm -hmm. really exposing themselves daily. Some have gotten sick and been hospitalized with it. So, and they are afraid to actually pass this on to their family. So they are all quarantining themselves and not coming home. And so they have isolation mm -hmm. and their support system is absolutely changed you know oh, yeah. so thank god for telehealth where yes. i can see them and continue to support them then others were sidelined because when we were closed That's down right. they were sort of like doing nothing and some of them fared quite well because for the first time they could work out they could be with their <laughs> families they could rest better they weren't working as hard and and they took a much needed pause mm. And so that was interesting. Their mental yeah. health actually increased some because they wow. were initial. But it was interesting to see they also suffered from like uh, survivor's guilt in sure. a way. They were guilty that <laughs> other colleagues were really working so hard and they were taking a break. So mm -hmm. it, it affects you in so many different ways. And yeah. you have to look at it from, from individuals and what they need and what's happening for each of them. Yeah, what's what's good for one may not be good for another. May not be good for another. For sure. Maybe a whole different need, you know. And then if you have any trauma from the past, it wakes everything up. Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So if you if, and you may have worked out that trauma at one point, it just raises itself again. It gives you an opportunity to rework and to reprocess the trauma. Wow. So it's it can be a double whammies. Yes. Yeah. Often yes. Yeah. Um. You know, as we as we look at this crisis, uh, you know, obviously the personal loss is the is the greatest thing for yeah. you. Uh, other than yeah. outside of that, the most disturbing thing about going through this crisis has been what? I think I think it's the collective suffering. Mm. Actually, I participated in a vigil that was uh, for mourning the the dead people you know mm. the many people we lost right. and their names were spoken and i tell you it was so deeply moving mm. you know so there's a grief right now that is kind of like unspoken in a way and we have no place to go with it so i found it helpful to actually participate in that online vigil where you you're really letting yourself really grieve for the life's lost mm. You know. Yeah, it's been so hard on the funerals and the and the gatherings of any right. kind like that. It's right. just been really, really tough. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, in in caring for all of that, you you mm. you have to do that on a professional basis. Right. Um, how do you, how do you do that on a personal basis? Right. How how do you how do you be a therapist to the therapist? <laughs> right. Right. So the first thing I did is to up the connection. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so we created Zoom kind of platforms for us to be with our Sabbath school, for us to be with our fellowship group, for us to have family gatherings on a regular basis. Yeah. We upped the connection and that really helps me. The, the second thing that I was really mindful of doing, whether I felt like it or not, and believe me, a lot of times I didn't feel like <laughs> it and I still don't, is to just keep exercising, keep yeah. taking really good care of my body, doing things on a daily basis that kind of disconnect me, like disconnect from news, disconnect mm -hmm. from all of the things related to this, mm -hmm. and just do something that is completely like not related. That's great. That's Simple. But yeah. not related. That, that's really mm -hmm. that. That's, that's a great counsel for all of us. Uh, to mm -hmm. That disconnection from yeah. too much over, yeah. over, over notification about it. Right. The brain and the heart need a break mm -hmm. from 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 that. I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not trying to raise fear. But, but from mm -hmm. from as we, as we dealt with this thing, what was what's been the most fearful part? Mm -hmm. Has there been a fearful a fearful part that just you've mm -hmm. had to hear about, do, mm -hmm. or felt yourself? Right. So absolutely. Early on, when my office wasn't closed yet, I was quite aware that the population I see is oh, kind of a risk population. Yes. So everybody I see is exposed to the nth degree and they're coming in, mm. you know, with that. So I was afraid for it for myself, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and the second thing I was afraid for is the kids. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. they are young and I was afraid that they might not take it as seriously. But thankfully, 
they have been absolutely like, no, we understand, and masks and all that. We care for people. We want others to be well. And they are absolutely really staying with the guidelines. Oh, you know, So that scary. was a relief for sure. me. But there is an uncertainty that is beyond that, right? There's an uncertainty that is for our community here mm -hmm. in the church. Right. And how do we care for each other? And I'm forever thinking about the most vulnerable mm -hmm. among us. And, and so I, I think of different ways. So our Sabbath school, for example, we created a fund, you know, to help some families that had lost j their jobs and right. who needed help yeah. um, in, in, in any other types of things that we can do. It helps to lower the anxiety when you feel like there's so much out of control, but these things I can do. Here's so something I can do. invest in that. Yeah. You know? That was interesting. In that first video we showed, I think the second week of the crisis, mm -hmm. about Natan, Natan Sharansky, who had been a, you know, just, you know, d control what you can control. Don't worry about right. things you can't control. Right. Yeah. Right. So true. Yeah. Uh, during the toughest moments of this journey, mm -hmm. since, since we've run into this thing, mm -hmm. um, have there been scriptures or songs or quotations that mm -hmm. have, that where you found some kind of support as well? Mm hmm yeah, there are songs. I, I can't think of one here, but I love music mm -hmm. and I love to play the right. piano just for myself, you know, and I do that a lot to just kind of like really help me, you know, to kind of deal with my own emotions. Therapeutic. Therapeutic. It is. Yeah. yeah. And there are certainly, you know, verses and, you know, I will go with you through the valley of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a promise. It doesn't say there will be no death. It just says he's here. He's mm -hmm. with me. Right. Take a deep breath. You're not alone. Yeah. Um, that's that, really helpful to me. That whole companionship in, in this yes. alone time when we're not connecting, that's, right. that's very, that, to realize right. that that eternal presence is with us. Always. Is always. Eternally present. Yeah. It was interesting. Um, just before my cousin was uh, intubated and put on the ventilator, mm -hmm. he actually sang a Bible verse saying the Lord will see me through and, and it was something he used to sing to wow. his kids, you my, know? My. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, and it's recorded and, and, and it was like on a phone call cause sure. he was in isolation. Um, just the most moving thing, mm -hmm. you know? The, well, yeah. the show where his confidence lies. Right. And that's, and that's that gives us comfort oh, now sure. too, you know? You have to take, continuing education to right. keep your certifications up and right. that kind of thing. So, so we, we go through a crisis like this and mm. there are learnings and yes. we don't want to lose the learnings. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you think of any learnings that we ought to make sure we hold on to as we've gone through this? Right. So for me, the first learning is, you know, you think something is important, think again, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we make a big deal out of things that at the, when you are faced with what we're being faced now, it's like, let's get down to the basics. Okay. People mm -hmm. are important. That's right. it. Your hair color, whether you find out my true hair color in three <laughs> weeks or not, not so important. Right. Yeah. We're dealing with life here. And so that's one thing. The second thing is that this idea of like independence, mm. we are interdependent. Yes. What you do impacts me, and what I do impacts you. But more than that, I, I'm reminded of the, that quote from uh, Tuesdays with Maury mm. when he said, when you're born, we need others to survive. Yeah. When we're dying, we need others, right? But in between, we need others even more. <laughs> That's really true. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. One of the things that struck me in this journey from a learning is, is the world has shrunk. Yes. The COVID doesn't know borders. Nope. Doesn't know nationalities, no. ethnicities. It, it is no. a, it, and it, it should it should remind us, I hope, mm -hmm. that we are one family, one human family. Yes. And, uh, yeah, and all, and absolutely. All in crisis together. It's one community, really. This the, the, the idea of borders, it's totally a false thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I love the idea that we are a church without walls. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, it exemplifies this peace that it's like, there's no such thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So uh, any ways that this experience has interacted with your faith and your connection with Jesus? Hmm. So, uh, you know, to me, um, Jesus is most present, like, in people, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and I think that we are Jesus' feet and hands. Mm -hmm. So I'm really aware that that's who he has. Right. Right. And so every day I try and, and sort of connect with that and to think, uh, how would you like me to carry your love and care today? Mm. You know, and it gives me a certain kind of sort of like, um, what would you say, a partnership with him? Yeah. I'm not so much asking him for stuff, you know, because I'm not sure how that goes. <laughs> you know? yes. But what I am conscious of is that we are in relationship and that I might be able to be his carrier, mm. his instrument in some kind of way. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. No. I mean that in a conscious way that, that really is very grateful that he uses us human beings yeah. in, in a way that might be of help to another person. Yeah, that's, that is beautiful. And yeah. th th we truly are the body of yes. Christ. Yeah, yeah, that way. Yeah. We've had a lot of weeks now mm. um, not assembling here. Yes for our services. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, you know, the, it begins to wear on us as a, as a congregation, I think a little bit as well. Yes. Uh, how, any ways um, mm. that you're thinking about church in general or the mm. importance of church or meeting together, mm -hmm. how has this altered your thoughts about church? Mm. So uh, to me, I feel connected actually yeah. to our church. I feel connected online when I'm watching the service. But more than that, we have our small groups, yes. several of them. And we have even had potlucks that are virtual potlucks. <laughs> virtual potlucks. Yeah. Can't smell the food. but <laughs> Can't smell the food, but we can sh share. And it's really fun. That's and neat. we can stay connected in that way. Now, it's not the same. Now, you know me. I'm hugger. I'm oh, from yeah. Brazil. Sure. I, you know, um, I miss that. And I will miss mm -hmm. that. But for the sake of us all. We have to find some creative ways, yeah. you know? So we create chat rooms in, in Telegram or, you know, WhatsApp, whatever, and we stay in touch. We have a prayer group with sisters that are all over the country, and we meet for brunch on <laughs> virtually, you know? Yeah. So I would say, if anything, I'm more connected, actually, because mm. I'm more conscious of the fact that I can't be there in person. We can't meet. Yeah. And so now, how can I be there? And how can you be there for me? That's interesting you know? that, that we, we're we sort of spoiled by the reality of being there with each other. Yes. And when we don't have that now, we, we, the intentionality behind it yes. maybe makes it more noticeable for us as yes. well. That's I think good. it will make us better, Andy. I hope. I think it will <laughs> connect us more. But we have to be careful not to get so complacent with our isolation. I think that if we are isolated and we get to, it, the brain gets used to everything, mm -hmm. you know? So it has to be really intentional that we do not sort of like think that we are alone, it's a pandemic, we're not going to be together. No, let's find ways to be in small groups. Let's find ways to encourage each other, to be with each other, and to share what's happened, the good, the bad, and the in-between. Mm. That's, that's, really, that's really important. As we think about our mission and our vision as a church, mm -hmm. um, how, how any advice or what was mm -hmm. the best ways for us to be still on mission and still fulfilling our, mm -hmm. our vision while this is going on? Right. So I'd love to see us do some more platforms online where there's conversations and people come for those conversations, mm. in particular now with all this unrest oh, yeah. and the whole, you know, um, racial issue. There's so much we can do about that. We have great models in Christianity and we have very poor models that <laughs> we have been ourselves, right? Certainly. But, but the model itself in Jesus Christ is amazing. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to prepare ourselves to lead conversations, and, but mostly to listen to create yeah. safe spaces where we can be listening and asking open, honest questions where we're learning, you right. know. I think this would be a great time for us to do that. People are looking for safe spaces to have conversations that yeah. are meaningful and real yeah. and where they can be heard. Really, the best thing, that the best gift we can give a person is to listen. Today. It is so true, Hurley. I, I think I think one of the reasons I like being a pastor is I get to speak and everybody listens. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but, but the you know they I guess we're told that the the human spirit can't tell the difference between 
being loved and being listened to. That those are synonymous. That's true. Um, that's true. Yeah. Why do you think t therapy works so well? <laughs> I mean, people come and they say, wow, nobody has ever listened to me in this way. And it's true, yeah. right? But why is that, that yeah. we can't do that for each yeah. other, right? It, it, I, I'm always amazed when a person comes to see me with some crisis or problem and and I, I ask three questions and listen right. a lot. And right. they're like, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you so much. You did so much. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just listened to you. Right. <laughs> that's how powerful yeah. it is. It really is. Uh, yeah. That's great. Um, I think about, um, oh, yeah, so thinking about caring for people and being yes. Christ's hands and body in, yes. the, in the world. Uh, where can we... What are some recommendations for maintaining good mental health during the crisis? And what are some suggestions for helping others to maintain good right. mental health during the crisis? Uh, you probably covered it already. but I'll Yeah. Think. So in summary, I would say really attend to your own processes, right? And it's okay for us to break down. By the way, I do it regularly, sure. right? When the, the grief hits me, mm -hmm. um, that's part of the human condition is that we must process all emotions, not just the good ones, <laughs> right. right? And so we take care of it. But I do not let myself to be there 24 seven, right? Mm -hmm. I say, okay, you got your, you, you're a guest here, I serve you tea and we talk, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of this, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go walk to the lake, I'm going to look for green things. I'm going to look for good things because there's a lot of right yes. that's happening in the world. But our brains, they kind of like focus on the bad and there is too much bad right now. So you got to train your brain to actually, at the end of the day, what inspired me today? What really is right with this world? Mm. Today? And it might be something you did yeah. or it might be something somebody did for you or with you. Right. So I think it's important to attend to that and to not allow ourselves to just be in despair because it looks pretty bad, like the world world's on fire. But in the midst of that, grace is happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can we put our glasses on and, and see it and look for it? And more than that, can we be the grace that we seek as well? Because sometimes that's all the control we have. Yeah. Right. So we can let we can let despair come in as a guest. But don't let them move in. <laughs> don't let them move in. That's a good way of putting it. And I'd say the last thing I would say, stay connected. You've got to have a community. If you didn't have a community, uh, you know, before this, this is prime time. Mm -hmm. We cannot really survive without others right now. Right. Right. And, and, it's, and it's an yeah. illusion that we ever thought we could. But, but we, yeah. we, we thought we could. This pandemic has definitely pulled the curtain over that illusion. And that's a good thing. Oh, very good. That's yeah. a good thing. There's good that can come from this bad. I'm not trying to be Pollyannish. I'm no. not, you know, but I think if we can't take the good here, then it will be wasted. Mm. What do you think God might want to say mm. to the whole life church about how to mm. be of courage and move forward? Yeah, I'd say God's saying right now, I'm with you. Mm. Okay, I'm going to see you through. Yeah. We don't know tomorrow, but he does. And certainly he has promised to be with us. And I think he's saying, fix your eyes here, okay? Let me take care of this. Just partner with me. That's what he's saying. Thank you so much. For You're sharing. welcome. You're welcome. It's my privilege. Yeah. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all oh, my days. I haven't held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been there I've known you as 
Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy being part of our service and we're inspired by the words from Herdley and as we shared the, the conversation. I think it's really incredible that we ended with the fact that she says that what we really think the word from God would be, I am with you. And, and I believe that all of scripture is God saying over and over, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, and then occasionally asking, will you be with me? And so take courage. God is with you, and he invites us to be with him as well. And so I hope that will be encouraging to you this week, and you can live your life with that thought in mind all week. God is with me. Let's bow our heads in benediction. Father, we thank you for your grace, for the opportunity to hear and experience this conversation today. Father, I, I pray comfort for Hurley's cousins, family, the, all the ones that are touched by that loss and it's magnified over and over thousands and thousands of times around our globe. And I just pray for all those who have suffered loss in such a way. May you, may you bring comfort and healing. And may they sense that you are with them. In Jesus' name, amen.